my pleasure to finally formally introduce Kate Schmier. Kate holds an MFA in fiction from Sarah Lawrence College and a BA from the University of Michigan, where she received the Virginia Voss Memorial Scholarship for Excellence in Writing. Her writing has appeared in Paper Brigade, Apogee Journal, Tin House, Lilith, CNN, Alma, and elsewhere, and has aired nationally on NPR. Her prize-winning story in Lilith was selected for the magazine's recently published anthology, Frankly Feminist. Kate, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. Well, to start off and dive right in, I'd love to have you summarize the Virgin Grandmother in your own words. I also know that the story is part of a novel in progress. So I'd just love to hear about that as well and how Francis's story fits into this longer work. Absolutely. Um, and first of all, I just wanted to, again, thank you and the entire team at Paper Brigade and Jewish Book Council. Um, the process, I know I've said this a hundred times, but the process of working on this story with you all was amazing and you helped to strengthen the story and um, I'm just really honored to, to have had it published in Paper Brigade. Um, so a little bit about the story. Uh, the Virgin Grandmother centers around Frances, who is about 70 years old and uh, she owns a stationery and invitation store in suburban Detroit. Um, and one day Saul, who is an old friend of hers from her past, reappears in her life. And at this point, Francis is divorced and Saul's wife, Nadine, um, has passed away some years earlier. And Francis is on the one hand, fiercely independent, um, but she's also lonely. And she has to contend with her conflicting desires for uh, that independence on the one hand, but also her desire for companionship. Um, and in terms of the larger project that I'm working on, uh, it's called The Store. And it's an intergenerational story of four women from different eras. And the thing that unites them is that they are all store owners or would be store owners. And Frances is one of the central characters in this larger work. And we see her appear at different moments of her life. It's fascinating. I absolutely can't wait. And I'm sure that everyone here watching cannot wait to read the full novel. Um, it sounds just fascinating. Um, I also wonder if you could tell us a bit just about the inspiration for this story and the novel, because I know there's a very interesting backstory there. Yes. Um, well, Frances is loosely based on my own maternal grandmother, who um, some of the friends and family from home who are on this call uh, actually knew her. And uh, like the character, uh, my grandmother got divorced after a long marriage. And then she sort of had this second act um, as an entrepreneur when she opened a store in her 60s. And she wound up running the business until she was well into her 80s. And even in her 90s, she would still call on certain customers. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's the inspiration for Francis. And in the larger project, there's also a character based on my great grandmother who owned a millinery shop in Detroit in the early 20th century. Um, and this was considered a very uncouth thing for a Jewish girl to do at the time. And in fact, her father would call her a nafka, which is uh, Yiddish for tramp. Um, but, uh, you know, she had this independent streak and she was very determined to do things her, her way. So my inspiration really comes from these strong, irreverent Jewish women who were my ancestors. That's so interesting. I feel like, Kate, you come from like generations of trailblazers here. Um, and it's just it's just fascinating. Do, do you feel like also the, the younger generations are inspired by you in your family? Or is that more of a of a divergent uh, thing from the actual history? Oh, the younger generations present yeah, like in this story. Josie. Yes. Um, she, you know, she's not, uh, I think we talked about this, um, that she's not really based on, on me. I mean, there are some, some elements of her story. Um, so that the character of Josie from the Virgin Grandmother is also 
a character in the larger project. And we also see her uh, in this story, she's a teenager, but in the larger project, she's an adult. Um, but um, she's largely fictionalized, uh, some elements of the truth, but but mostly she's just uh, her own person. Awesome. I, I can't wait to read it. Um, I think, you know, one thing that you mentioned this before when you were sort of giving an overview of your story is like the core of this story is really Frances's struggle between her desire for companionship and her desire for independence. And I wonder if you could just read for everyone um, a section of the story that first, that depicts her first meeting with Saul, you know, this man who becomes a source of potential companionship for her. Absolutely. Um, so I will read an excerpt. Um, you know, this, this comes from near the beginning of the story uh, when an old friend named Saul appears in Francis's store uh, and he wants her help selecting an invitation for his daughter's wedding. And uh, this brings up some, some old feelings and memories for Francis. Saul took off his tiger's cap. They were both nearing 70, but Saul had looked like somebody Zadie for as long as Francis could remember. My Anna finally met someone. That's why I came in. Say no more, Saul. I'm sure we can find something beautiful for the occasion. You always had such great taste. Nadine used to say, I wish I could make our house look like Fran's. The house on Outer Drive was exquisite, Francis thought. Before she married Ira, she had dreamed of being a fashion illustrator. At 18, she'd taken classes at Wayne State University. The professor brought in models wearing the latest styles from Hudson's. Francis would sketch them with a pencil, then bring them to life with watercolor. The instructor said she should get out of Detroit and go study at Pratt. She imagined living in a tiny apartment, gallivanting around New York with other creative types. But who had the money for all that? And besides, nice Jewish girls didn't go off to New York alone. The house on Outer Drive became her canvas. What fun she'd had putting her touch on each room. Years later, she'd been ready to give up her marriage, but the house was another story. Nadine was too kind, she told Saul now. Sometimes I wonder if that's what killed her, Saul said. Nadine had been the sort of woman who baked fresh challah and made an endless supply of matzo ball soup. Frances wasn't that kind of bogey. She worked on Shabbos and could barely make a filter fish from a jar. She offered her family a different form of sustenance, her own irreverent wisdom. Last week, she told her granddaughter to take up smoking because it looked better than biting her nails. The girl laughed so hard, she forgot about the boy who'd stomped on her heart. Still, when Fran's time came, no one, surely not her family, would say she was too good for this world. Thank you so much, Kate. That's just beautifully written. And I'm really impressed in how just that short passage, you convey so much about these two characters. Um, and actually something that, that strikes me when I hear you read the passage again is how present the past is in Francis's life. You weave flashbacks into the story so organically that the reader you know, might not realize it, but more than half of that passage was actually made up of flashbacks of, Fran of Francis's memories. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Francis's unrealized, unlived potential and the historic, the historical forces that kind of shaped that shaped her life. And why was it so important to mention those unrealized dreams in your story? Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you felt that it was organic because it's a tricky thing. You know, you don't want there to be so much backstory that, uh, you know, it overshadows the present day narrative. But in Fran's case, I did feel that it was important to give some of that context and that sense of history. Um, you know, she comes from a generation of women um, where women really weren't encouraged to pursue careers. So, you know, as I read in this excerpt, Frances, as a younger woman, dreamed of being a fashion illustrator, but, you know, she was a daughter of the Depression and there wasn't money for her to continue her education or, you know, go off to New York. And there was also the societal expectation that she would get married and have children. And 
she does do that. But unlike Saul's wife, Nadine, who I tried to depict as a more traditional Bobby, um, you know, Frances never really stops thinking about those, those dreams that she had for herself. Um, you know, and, and so that's the, the unrealized potential part. It's like that old adage, I was born too early and started too late. Um, and that, that also kind of comes from a detail about my own grandmother toward the end of her life. We actually discovered, um, this stack of, of fashion illustrations that she had done when she was younger and we didn't even know that they existed. And it turned out that she had kept them for 60 something years. Um, and that just really stuck with me, um, you know, about, and I think it really does speak to the power of those dreams that we have for ourselves and the way, the ways that we hold on to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. Kate, thank you so much for for answering those questions. And I just want to remind everyone watching to put your questions in the chat or raise your virtual hand if you have any questions. Um, and as you're doing that, I'm just going to hand things over to Carol for Carol, your questions. Hi, Kate. Hi, Carol. Hi. So I know you've spoken and written about how your family history helped to inspire your short story and the novel in progress. I'm wondering, who are some of your literary inspirations? Sure. Well, I have many, um, but a few that come to mind. Uh, one was is uh, Joan Silber, who I was fortunate enough to study with at Sarah Lawrence College. Um, particularly her most recent three works, Fools, Improvement, and Secrets of Happiness. Um, and she's really a master of uh, these link stories where a minor character in one uh, chapter becomes a central character in the next. And the way she deals with time and place, you know, it's you're in New York one moment and then you're in Turkey and then you're in Southeast Asia. And um, she just really has this extraordinary ability to take the reader on a, on a journey. Um, another uh, one that comes to mind is Elizabeth Strout and her novel, Olive Kitteridge, which I found myself kind of returning to as I've developed uh, Francis's character. Um, you know, the character of Olive is, is very different from Francis, and obviously they come from very different backgrounds, but I think the, th the thing they have in common is they're both these kind of strong, um, a bit prickly, older women. Um, but they also have this vulnerability. And I think that's the thing that, that Strout um, evokes so beautifully. Um, and, um, and then an, another inspiration is the Israeli novelist David Grossman, um, and particularly his novel, To the End of the Land. Um, he creates this, this character, Aura, who is a mother um, whose son is, is going off to war and the way he's able to just get into this woman's psyche and convey the the mental anguish that she's going through. Um, so those are those are some, but I just also wanted to say that I feel that I'm extraordinarily lucky to have, you know, a lot of friends who are writers, some of whom are on this call today, um, who are, you know, just brilliant writers and, and give me a lot to be inspired by and, and to aspire to. So I'm, I'm fortunate to be part of uh, those communities. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. I know for, that, that highlighting women's voices in Jewish literature and in history is a focus of your work. And I know that your novel in progress is called The Store. Mm -hmm. Or is it just store? The store, yeah. The store. And I, I love to hear your thoughts about the concept of a store. That 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 your 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 I guess great grandfather called your grandmother, or I lost track of the generations. Mm -hmm. enough yeah, for, yeah. For opening, wanting to open a store. What, what, I, I, and I also know that, that we all know that it was mostly men who mm -hmm. went from peddlers mm -hmm. to accumulating enough money to open a store. 
and the rest became history. You know, some of those stores turned into Abraham and Strauss. Some of them stayed little stores, but what, whatever, the store. What yeah. What about the store? Absolutely. Regarding women. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, well, in this particular story, in the Virgin Grandmother, um, what I was trying to convey is that the store really becomes um, a vehicle for Frances to live out some of the ambitions that she was unable to fulfill as a younger woman. And, you know, at the end of this story, without giving too much away for those that, that haven't read it, is, um, you know, that's a big part of the realization that she comes to, um, that by having the store, she is living at least a version of the life that she imagined for herself. Um, and in the in the larger project, uh, the store, you know, is the title, but it's also just a, a real central part of of the of the narrative. Um, and the idea, I think, for me, it really symbolizes, as you said, female entrepreneurship, freedom, independence, um, all of those all of those elements. Um, you know, and I just think about the character of Frances, and at one point she you know, she's talking to Saul and she is explaining to him that, you know, she didn't even have a credit card in her own name until she was in her late 40s. Um, and I know today this, you know, sounds un unbelievable to us, at least it did to me, but, um, you know, women were not in this country, weren't allowed to have credit cards in their own names until 1974. So for somebody like Frances to go from just complete financial dependence on her husband um, to running her own business uh, is a huge thing. Um, so, and it, and it, and the store, and it means something a little different, you know, in the larger project, you know, for each of the characters, like you mentioned, um, uh, the character, uh, her name is Celia, and she has a millinery store the way that my great grandmother did. Um, so it's a little bit of a, of a different situation for her, but in all of these cases, um, you know, as you said, it was a non-traditional thing for women to, to have their own businesses and, um, it, it really becomes a vehicle for them to, to feel empowered and, and free. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to center women's stories and women's voices in my work. And um, I'm just honored and and uh, a little verklempt um, that uh, the Jewish Book Council wanted to, to do that by featuring this story in Paper Brigade. Well, thank you. That's a great answer. It also occur it occurs to me that your story has made me focus on the concept of store and also the multiplicity of skills and talents it takes to open and run and can you know, a, a store successfully. It's yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it takes, you know, I think in, in Francis's case and in in another character, Celia's case, um, it, it takes creativity, but it also takes moxie. And business um, and yes. skills and so much. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, for my grandmother, uh, you know, she used to say that she never really knew she had that in her until she opened the business that she discovered through the store what she was capable of. Um, and so I think that legacy has stuck with me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. That was really interesting. And I want to now turn to the um, questions from, from all the other people um, who are listening and watching in today. First of all, I also just want to say there's tons of pre's in the comments when you have a chance um, to look at them. Many people saying th there was one mention that she said specifically that she was so excited there's going to be um, a novel because she can't wait to spend more time with the character of Frances. And this is not the last we've seen of her. So um, many eager readers for whenever the novel comes out. Um, so one person, I have here a question that I think is very interesting from Mark Cohen. How do you think the emphasis on short story form in MFP, 
MFA programs have impacted present day novel writing? How has it impacted your style of novel writing? Um, so the emphasis on short story form and MFA programs, well, you know, at least on my, in my MFA program, you know, it's, it's the MFA is built around the workshop model, which is, um, you know, it's, you share your work with the rest of the class. Um, and then in the next session, um, they, they, they have to come in with their feedback. Um, so I think that's a lot of the reason that short stories are, are emphasized in MFA programs is because, you know, you it's it's very difficult um, to uh, between classes at least you wouldn't really be able to give someone a full manuscript and I think it's very very difficult to workshop a novel because um, you know just reading one chapter without the full context. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's sort of a difficult thing. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure in, in terms of the question of how MFA programs, the short story form and MFA programs have impacted present day novel writing. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but I will say that um, my MFA, I think I found to be incredibly helpful. Um, I was, as I said, I mentioned Joan Silver, um, I also had some other incredible professors, one of whom might be here today, Stephen O'Connor. Um, so, you know, for me, it was really, you know, being part of a literary community. I have relationships with a number of the people, writers I went to school with um, to this day, and they're often kind of my beta readers. Um, so that's what how I can speak to my own personal experience. Thanks, Kate. Joel asks, which I also think is a very fascinating question. It's one thing to create a character from whole cloth, another to write a character that is modeled after a real person. What was it like creating a character based on your beloved Buffy? Um, well, I, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that it's a delicate balance because, you know, at the end of the day, this is a work of fiction. So, you know, if it were, if I were just wanting to tell a story about um, my grandmother, I would write, you know, an essay and I have written essays about her, but um, in this, you know, I'm, I want to tell a, sto a short story that, that feels self-contained. So my allegiance, if you will, was really to the integrity of, of the story of shaping that fictional story, as opposed to feeling like I had to squeeze in all these different details about my grandmother, um, or even to make the character of Frances exactly like my grandmother. You know, she is a fictional character and in her own right. Um, so, you know, in terms of the decisions that I made, you know, as a writer in creating this story, um, it was it was really about trying to just make it um, a compelling story um, rather than to uh, try to replicate who my grandmother was. But it was a fun process, you know, and I think having that, I think anyone who's on this call who knew my grandmother, she was a real character. And just having her voice kind of in my mind as I was writing, you know, uh, felt kind of like a guide. That's awesome. Um, Marcella also asks about the title of the story, um, which I happen to love. This title mm. is just so you immediately immediately captures captures your attention and your curiosity. Um, and she asks why the virgin grandmother. And I know that it is something that actually Saul says to Francis. Um, but why? What? Why? What was it important about that to you to have it as as a title? Yeah, so in the story, um, the virgin grandmother actually comes from a line in the story. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much away, but um, I'll, That's I'll okay. just, I'll just reveal. Yeah, that uh, yeah. I think most people brought it's up, but basically, club, so, yeah. sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, in one scene of the story, um, sort of the climactic scene of the story, um, Saul sort of propositions Francis and even though they're um, they're not in love, um, they're not even really dating, 
but he says, you know, why don't we just get married? You know, we're, we're both getting older. Um, you know, we need, let's, we can take care of each other. We can be companions for each other. You're alone. I'm alone. Why not? Um, and she ends up, you know, resisting this idea. And, you know, he even says, well, you know, why don't we just go in the bedroom and, you know, get to know each other a little bit. And she again pushes back and that's when he calls her a virgin grandmother. So that's, that's where that, that line comes from. Um, but I think, um, you know, it also has some symbolism too. I mean, obviously she is a grandmother in the story and the relationship with her granddaughter, Josie is another central part of the story. Um, and the virgin grandmother, I just, it, it, to me, it's just, it's funny. So I, I liked it, but also, you know, it highlights that she's, again, this is kind of a late in life coming of age story. So she's older, but there's also a little bit of that, that innocence. Yeah, I so. love that. And one thing that we haven't even mentioned yet, although it is one o'clock, is just the humor in this story. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there, there are definitely these moments that I would say, in general, it's a more, you know, just really poignant story. But then there's these moments of humor that I think you weave in so well, and just come at the, at the most opportune moments. Um, so as I said, it is one o'clock, but I just want to take one more question, um, which is from Erica Dreyfus. Erica, thank you for asking this question. It's a wonderful question, as always. Um, and Erica says that she's always interested in the editor's thoughts about what stood out to them about this writer's story as they reviewed the many fiction submissions that Paper Brigade routinely receives. Um, and so I think that Carol and I, um, so sadly, are. Um, Fiction editor Josh Rolnick couldn't be here today. Um, absolutely loved Kate's story. So um, I can't really answer on his behalf, but just to say that he also just, I'm sure would be springing in with many, many, many praises at this moment. But I'll just say that for me, um, I think that the the way that Kate, you managed to construct this story um, and bring in so many different elements that then tied in together at the end was very striking. I think it's hard to, to sort of like combine so many different threads. I mean, we have Francis, we have, and Saul's relationship, we have Francis's relationship with her um, former husband. We also have her relationship with her granddaughter, um, you know, among other people. And I think that it's really a, an accomplishment to be able to take so many threads and actually wind them together and create a complete story um, that feels, as I said, very organic and not forced, um, but just very um, natural. And we know that behind that is actually very keenly planned. And then I would say that just the, the character of Francis for something this short, she's a very, very complex character, as we've discussed, um, with a lot of history. Um, and so, you know, I think that for me, as for many people who are watching right now, um, she just was a standout character and so unique. Um, and, you know, we might have a caricature of a Bubby or, you know, grandmother, and she really pushes it back against that. Um, although she's very close with her grandchildren. Um, and then finally, I would just say, you know, the writing, Kate, as I just said, I think that the mix, it's it's very beautiful. It's very economical. It's It pulls in those elements of humor, even when you're not really expecting it. But it also tells a story that in the end comes a complete circle. And we really do see Francis sort of undergoing a real transformation um, internally. So those are many things that, uh, Kate, I loved about your story. Um, Carol, I don't know if you have anything to add that you'd like to add. Oh, Carol, you're on mute. <laughs> I think he covered the, uh, the territory very, very well. The only thing I can think to add, you know, just off the top of my head is that the 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 setting, the place, the world that you created was was very vivid. These characters, it made the characters 
seem that seem three dimensional. The, the story was three dimensional. I could picture that place and the, the club and the, the yeah the Hungarian the Hungarian tarts on the yeah. golf course. It, it was vivid and um, it, it grabs you, which is you know hard to define, but unmistakable when it happens so that's for me in addition to all the uh formal criteria that it, that you know intuitive sense as it is for so many people is you know super important thank you so much um i really appreciate the kind words and i'm, I'm glad it came off um and the characters came off in in a three-dimensional way. Um, you know, this story was very, very close to me and I, I'm glad that came through. Yeah, Great. absolutely. This, the whole world is beautifully constructed. Everything from like the characters, the place to their, you know, conflicts and, and you know, attractions to one another. It just is all beautiful. Um, I know that we are now five minutes over time. So unfortunately, I think that we'll have to stop for now. But Kate, thank you so much. This was just incredible. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. If you enjoyed this conversation and you'd like to read more of Faber Brigade, we're posting the link to purchase the 2023 issue and the discount code again. I'd also like to encourage you to support us by becoming a JBC member. Our mission at JBC is to educate and enrich the community through Jewish literature. We're a small nonprofit and support from readers like you is crucial to our initiatives. The next meeting of Paper Brigade Short Story Club will be with the author and translator of Furthermore, the winner of the Paper Brigade Award for New Israeli Fiction. We'll meet on June 9th and you can find, or I'm sorry, um, we'll meet on April 17th. I don't know why I put the wrong date in my notes. And you can find a link to register for that in the chat as well. So I very much hope to see you all there. Thank you again and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks everyone.